Hello. Good evening, everybody. Can you hear me, Sanish? Hello. Yeah, 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 we can hear you. Hello. Yeah, we can hear. You. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Uh, right. uh, so, coming to our next session of the Indian College of Anesthesiologists webinar this Wednesday. This is a very, very important webinar, which is not only very important for us clinicians and the anesthesiologists, but also the students and different specialities. who are interested in the palliative medicine. And today we are very moderators, but the speakers, they are the, they are the stalwarts in their speciality. And it's an honor to have all of them with us today. And in the audience today, uh, you'll all be very glad to know that it's not only we anesthesiologists who are participating, but a whole group of nurses and other academicians who are interested in palliative medicine. So really, we are really looking forward to a very, very grand webinar, and I'm sure we'll all go thoroughly enriched. So today, for the moderator, I would like to introduce and welcome Dr. Rajagopal. All three are stalwarts, as I said. Dr. Rajagopal, as we all know, is the father of palliative care in India, and he is the director of the WHO Collaborating Center at Trivandrum, and he is, got, he is the leader of the organization Pallium India, Pallium India. We all know him, we've all had the honor, some of us have had the honor of meeting him, and it'll be a pleasure for all of you to see him moderating today. And he is looking after the palliative care in the state of Kerala since several years, more than a decade, and he's a Padma Shri Award winner as well. Dr. Stanley, another stalwart in palliative care, and he is at the uh, Bangalore Baptist Hospital. I've had the pleasure of meeting him several times, and it's an honor for him to, for us to have him here with us at this webinar. And last but not the least, we have Dr. Abhijit Dam as our moderator, and he has been the president and the ex secretary of the Association of Palliative Care, and he is running the Koshish Hospice at the Rural Jharkhand. So we'd like to welcome all the moderators and I'd like to now invite them to introduce the speakers so that we can start the webinar. Thank you very much. Dr. Raj, your mic is muted. Dr. Rajgopal, please. I'm sorry. Um, to introduce the subject and to say in a couple of sentences its relevance to palliative care. Uh, I, I, the duty of care of a doctor, any doctor, including the anesthetist, is not clearly, was not clearly defined in India. Many countries have a law covering that. We don't. Uh, in 2018, Naveen, Naveen Salins was the chief architect of a document that uh, the Indian Council of Medical Research brought out. It defines the duty of care of a doctor like this. The duty of care is to mitigate suffering. It is to cure sometimes, to relieve often, and to comfort always. 
and there exists no exception to this rule. As an anesthetist, I was always concentrating on organs, organ function. And my aim was to send the patient out of the ICU or theater with as intact organs as possible. But I confess that I, for a long time, did not bother much about suffering. But Naveen Silence and the Indian Council of Medical Research uh, document remind us that we have the fundamental duty to relieve suffering. There exists no exception to that rule. And this subject of uh, palliative care, which is aimed only at suffering, it is treatment of serious health-related suffering. And we cannot have a better faculty than um, Cynthia and uh, Sushma and Naveen. Uh, <clears throat> I am leaving it to my fellow moderators to introduce the speakers. Thank you very much. Stan. Stanley McAdam. Have we some home lost Stan? Dr. Stanley? Sanish, can we start without introduction, Dr. No, 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 we will just give us a minute to introduce uh, if Dr. Stanley is not there. Uh, uh, maybe the, uh, though I do, I have not really looked at the CV that was sent yes. around. I have known Cynthia, Cynthia, how uh, long has it been? Uh, something like 21 years or so. Uh, and uh, a live wire would be two word description of Cynthia. She is uh, the head of Asia Pacific Hospice Palliative Care Network. <clears throat> and in that capacity is engrossed in this business, spreading the message of palliative care and practice of palliative care across the Asia Pacific region and at the international level. Thank you, Cynthia. I think it's Shushma who is the first speaker. I think, yeah, yeah. Oh, so, I'm so sorry. Uh, Stan, Stan, we were waiting for you, for your introduction of Sushma. I have already made the mistake of uh, introducing Cynthia first, misunderstanding. Please go ahead, Stan. Yeah, I'm sorry, I was having a problem with connectivity. Suddenly it went off. Uh, am okay. I okay? Yeah, yeah. Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Dr. Jayashree, thank you very yes. much for this wonderful webinar and this privilege to be one of the moderators. I'd just like to say a few words before I start introducing Dr. Sushma. Uh, the current and uh, relevant mantras in any healthcare, especially palliative care, are one is integration and the other is collaboration. We can have all the important um, specialities and the stakeholders come together, that is integration, but they, it, they also need to collaborate and work together for effectiveness. And that is this is what the WHO is emphasizing. And all over the world, this is the need. Well, in India, uh, in the palliative care context, the anesthesiologists have been the role model of integration and collaboration. The majority of our uh, senior faculty and also serious um, committed players in palliative care are all anesthesiologists. So you are the so-called masked people, people behind masks. And now see what the pandemic has done. It has got the whole world to follow you. Being masked says something that your identity is not important. It is who you are, the person behind that mask that is important. It is being which governs the doing. That's why we are called human being, not human doing. And from a personal faith perspective, from a Christian faith perspective, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount tells his disciples, 
you are the salt of the earth salt loses its identity and quietly it does it its work it makes all the difference when the food is when we enjoy food we say the food is good we don't say the salt is right or the salt is good and so it is <laughs> for us behind that mask or the person who we are and so friends let us in this seminar webinar learn and share to do just that so it's my pleasure now to introduce dr sushma batnagar a dear friend and colleague in palliative medicine she is the president of the indian association of palliative care can we have her slide with the her introduction her slide is it possible to put it up Uh, sir it, it's not i think you can enter it you can introduce like that. just okay. just can it yeah it's so over. dr sushma is the president and she is the editor of our indian journal of palliative care and as president she is making a tremendous difference in establishing palliative care firmly in our country so welcome dr sushma and there are many things that she has achieved and i won't go into that but i would say that she is making a huge difference for establishing palliative care in india welcome dr sushma thank you very much dr stanley uh, the slides uh, you will share or i will share to sanish uh, you can share ma'am you have given me the right to share yeah yeah fine you can share <clears throat> i can't see my the i can't see the shy sharing power i have send my slides if you want to share um you can do it ma'am screen share is enabled no i am not seeing my screen share just two minutes so uh, i have i think there is no uh, uh, ma'am you are no. using whiteboard or uh, presentation i have a presentation no so uh, i am i have sent my slides to dr bimla uh, if she can uh, no, um when you press the screen is... share and uh, once you open the powerpoint window once you press the screen share you can select that particular option that uh, i know powerpoint window no i think I... now whiteboard is selected yes that is the reason you can stop share and redo now powerpoint window uh, not coming only there is no powerpoint window coming anyway can i speak like otherwise or also in case if there is it is not coming i can't see the powerpoint no. window i can no, no now your desktop is shared you can open powerpoint okay i will i will open sorry yeah. uh, no powerpoint is open yeah powerpoint is open and then no, now uh, once you press the share screen you can select that window
So can you see my slides now? No, no. Hello? No? No, no. no. You can't no, see? First, first press the share screen button. Then maybe the fifth tab or fourth one, you can select the PowerPoint window. I'm so sorry. There is screen. Okay. PowerPoint window. Yeah. Now? Is it yeah, okay yeah, now? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Fine. Sorry uh, about this. Uh, thank you, Doctor. Uh, thank you, Madam uh, Jetri, ma'am. Uh, and thank you, Sanish. Uh, and this is first time I am speaking in the forum of uh, Indian uh, College of Anesthesiologists. And I'm so happy that Dr. Bimla has uh, uh, requested me that we should speak about, uh, we should talk and discuss about the palliative care in uh, this forum. And I'm so excited to see Dr. Raj Gopal, Dr. Radha Krishnan, all our seniors uh, over here. Uh, so whatever I have learned in palliative care in last 21 years, I will speak uh, in next 20 minutes. Uh, the, when I was becoming an anesthetist, I'm telling the truth that I was not having an idea that there is a term called, uh, when I was doing my MD, there is a term called palliative care exists. Although nowadays, anesthetists, those who are big doing MD and those who are clearing MD, they, are, they get at least some MCQs in palliative medicine. But that those days, there was no word called palliative care. So when I became, when I learned palliative care first time from 1990-98, I started realizing that how important it is to learn concept, basic concept of palliative medicine, because the way we have learned uh, our medicine, the way we have learned our anesthesia practice, I will speak in terms or in context with anesthesia practice in last 20 minutes. The way we have learned the anesthesia practice, I think it was incomplete without learning the concept of or without integrating the concept of palliative medicine uh, in our practice so uh, the for the students uh, this is such an important uh, one and a half hour that you will realize that how important to just learn it is not that you have to do some kind of a fellowship or some md palliative medicine but learn the concept of palliative medicine otherwise our practice of anesthesia will be remain incomplete. So the first uh, uh, first point which I want to say that we are already have a unique quality. And as, as an anesthesiologist, we have some unique qualities. So which we utilize, but we not utilize it completely because we don't have a concept of palliative medicine in our integration in our specialty. So what are our various qualities is there is a strong interpersonal capability in management of patient and families it is the branch where we have to we have to discuss multiple things with the patients and the family members during the pre operative rounds inter peri inter operative period when there is something wrong is happening or in the post operative so throughout the peri operative period we have to discuss or we have to have a good interpersonal relationship with patients and their family members Beside this, when patient is critically sick, that time also we need to discuss with the patients and family members. Their knowledge, our knowledge with their comfort and the analgesics, application of analgesics. The knowledge of applications on analgesics which anesthetists have, no one is having this kind of a knowledge. So it is the anesthetists are the people, those who have a very good, extraordinary knowledge of analgesics extraordinary or knowledge of analgesics we are having in terms of giving pain relief to the patients in perioperative period but we have to work something extra that how we can incorporate this knowledge into to relieve the suffering of a patient who is suffering with serious health related disorder this as dr rajgopal has said the knowledge of <clears throat> managing intractable symptoms we have a knowledge we can manage nausea we can manage vomiting, we can manage extraordinary well with breathlessness. We can manage patient, we can resuscitate patient very well, we can intubate patient very well, and we can revive patient very well. But when not to revive, when what extra we should do when patient is at the end stage of the disease, 
this we have to incorporate in our day to day practice titrating and monitoring skills no one can have the skills which we have the titrating and monitoring titrating of vasopressors titrating of analgesic everything we know very well but how when how and when we should titrate the analgesic drops properly when we should give the medication which can relieve the suffering of the patients not increase the suffering by giving unnecessary extra hours and extra days and the monitoring skills they are extraordinary monitoring skills but when a end is coming when a patient is having some kind of a different type of a when he have reached to the different type of a uh, disease state when we know that we are not going to give the cure to the patient what extra things we should monitor rather than just monitoring bp pulse rate and our monitors and then finally managing extraordinary anesthesiologist has extraordinary knowledge of managing patients in icu so how and when we should how we should not manage our patients when patient is critically sick and patient is also suffering some intractable disease which we all know in the icu that patient cannot be revived patient cannot be survived and then also we keep managing the patient so how we should so all these qualities we have extraordinary qualities anesthesiologists have but how and when they can change their practice by incorporating and integrating of palliative medicine in their practice this is what i will speak so in their personal capability and management of patients and family first point i know that we know we discuss with the patients and family member when patient is sick we go and discuss that patient is sick or patient has been arrested or we are going to intubate the patient patient is on ventilator patient is we are putting patients on vasopressor but if a patient is sick and the the whole team is thinking that this patient cannot be revived how we should change our gear this is what the palliative care will teach you so what with the first step will be that we will have a family meeting when patient is sick and you are about to intubate and you are planning and your knowledge of your existing knowledge says that now i have to intubate our patient this is what in covid patients also in the covid center we are practicing right now also then when we think that patient is a patient for example a distant metastatic patient and he is unfortunately having covid and patient is breathless that time we can start discussing with the family members right now we are not discussing in the family member face to face we are discussing on telephone but otherwise we can discuss with the family member we can make them understand about their diagnosis and prognosis and we can make the team member them also team member otherwise you know we don't make the family members and patient team member and we just give them a orders kind of a thing that we are going to do this we are going to do that because your patient is hypoxic your patient bp is falling so we are starting vasopressors but if we are going to explain them properly about the diagnosis and prognosis of all the disease they will be able to make the informed choices and once they will be able to make the informed choices there will be a full confidence between doctor and a patient you know uh uh we are students that we have lost almost long time back a good doctor patient re- uh, relationship we have lost confidence on the patient that's why the patient you know so many patient they send their x-ray they send their ct scan that my patient is in icu and they have put him on ventilator he he is in advanced stage of malignancy what should i do so you know this should not happen whenever the wherever the patient is there should be a strong bonding of patient and doctor and the whatever doctor and patient and the family members are discussing they should be a team member and they should be allowed to make the decision that what will be in the best interest of the patient that will be the practice r- real practice of medical ethics when uh, when we discuss when we will discuss the diagnosis and prognosis with the patient and then when the patients and the relatives will be able to make the informed choices that will when we will, then we will say that we are practicing correctly what should be in the best interest of the patient we have a good knowledge of analgesics but i want to ask anyone uh, uh, i don't okay, i cannot ask in chat box me if you want to answer that if this kind of a children they will come to you do you know how to handle these children when they are crying in pain the 
family members are crying the parents are severe they are suffering a lot because their child is crying in severe pain we don't know how to handle these type of pain management so we have a very good knowledge of perioperative pain management we have and we have invented so many new drugs we have invented so many new analgesics and now blocks and we give our today in these days every patient is having of absolute painless perioperative period but if this boy will come if these two boys will come to you and do you have a good knowledge how to handle the pain do you have a knowledge to give opioids to these children do you have a knowledge to titrate the analgesics for these children so this is what we have to make just just we have to extend our knowledge or we have to extend our horizon that we i know i know how to use paracetamol how to use tramadol how to use fentanyl how to use uh, morphine in my patient when the patient is in perioperative period but when this child will come how to use morphine to this child this also i should understand so that any whenever wherever my i will go if i will man, be if i will get a chance to manage patient pain chronic pain patient or acute pain patient i will have full knowledge to use for these kind of a children so this is what extra you have to do third thing uh, we have a good knowledge we know how to uh, peri in operative pe perioperative period we know how to maintain vital functions how to reduce mortality how to prevent morbidity this we are doing fantastically well and all the hospitals are doing very well but do you have a knowledge or do you have a habit or do you have have you practiced any time to when we cannot prevent mortality when we cannot when patient is morbidly sick do you have a habit of giving realistic hope to the patient and their relatives do you have a habit or courage to give honest information are going outside icu and giving honest information to the relatives that what is the right situation of the patient and how we should decide do you have a habit of maintaining quality of life as much as possible to the patient who is definitely not going to survive and who is morbidly sick so this is what we have to integrate extra in our in our day to day practice this is a very good article where we th this is very good article which will give you a insight that how expert how expert we are in managing critically sick patient based on this articles this article says that 14 to 20% of icu icu patient meet the typical trigger of for palliative care consultation how many of us have introduced palliative care in our intensive care unit how many of us palliative in our intensive how many of our intensive care units palliative care is also getting integrated or palliative care physician is also coming and giving consultation hardly any so this is the right time to think that at least 20% of patient in icu they need palliative care but in less than 1% of icu or more or must must be less than less than 1% or it must be in the points in icu we have integrated palliative care in the critical care so this is the right time that we should all our anesthesiologists have a good knowledge of concept of palliative care integrating palliative care in their practice so that these 20% of patients those who are in critical care unnecessary they are lying in ventil they are they are lying on ventilator unnecessary we are prolonging their suffering not only the patient suffering but the whole family member suffering we are prolonging and we will be able to reduce the suffering of all these patients <coughs> if at all if i will say today that in my uh, when we started uh, integrating palliative care in our intensive care there were many barriers and barriers are going to be there so what are what is the barriers the foremost barrier is we don't know transition transition means when my patient require palliative care consultation how this will come this will come only i this is not the time and i cannot speak in 20 minutes that this is the way how to be should recognize transition but if you will go into the depth then you will realize and you will have a good 
knowledge if you have a basic concept of palliative care you will have you will be able to understand and able to decide that when my patient needs consultation with palliative care or how okay i can provide palliative care or palliative medicine integration in my there are many barriers and these are the barriers which i have brought uh, which i have kept in the four boxes and i will go quickly on those four uh, boxes that professional culture our professional culture was we have learned that how to save life how to how to note down the vital signs and monitor vital, vital signs and we have very good very good habit and we have an attitude of depersonalizing stabilization that my patient should be stable his bp should be right his lungs should be uh, all right he should his abt should be fine what is happening as a total my patient out uh, to my patient and what is happening to my the caregivers outside those who are sitting wife husband daughter son they are sitting what what they they are thinking about this that we don't have any we don't we don't know and we don't care about it second thing is second thing very very important is time course uh, most of the time when patients land up in the uh, emergency we don't have we don't have time when patient is breathless we have learned that when a whoops over is coming in the emergency if a breathless patient is coming we should intubate this is what we have learned and this is what i have learned in my md but dear friends this is also very important that when not to intubate when not to resuscitate in emergency this is very important otherwise there will be no time when patient will be breathless there will be no time and these type of discussion if a patient is suffering with some kind of a chronic debilitating condition or a chronic serious health related disorder if patient is having if we have discussed it before in i aims there are patient those they are coming in emergency because they are breathless they are in severe pain but they says that we have been discussed and we have been explained already if you are going to intubate i don't want intubation i don't want ventilation i don't want to go to icu you just relieve my pain or i am having fluid in my lung please remove the fluid i will be less breathless and but i don't need intubation this is kind of practice we need all over the country so that we will be able to avoid unnecessary transferring of the patient in icu uncertainty is going to be there if we will not understand if we are uncertain if we don't know we are we just think that my uh, my uh, my aim or my duty is just to intubate the patient put on the ventilator and shift into into the icu we will not be able to allow our patient to make the decisions so we have to have a un, we have to really relieve our uncertainty i know that uncertainty really kills in these days uncertainty because of the covid is killing us and similarly uncertainty about the disease prognosis and diagnosis kills relatives so please make sure that our patients and their relatives they should be certain and they should have a clear cut care path so that they will be able to make decisions environment and communication and expensive resources these are again the barriers that we want that to use at to the extent that till ecmo i will not use i will not be able to say that my patient is now going peacefully so we have a habit of putting patient on ventilator and then vasopressors and then ultimately on ecmo so we have lot of faith on technological advancement but techno i am not against technological advancement but when should we use technology advanced technology how, and learning about the giving pain management giving symptom management this is also a one of a kind of advanced technology in medical science so we should turn our gear and we should try to relieve the suffering of the patient this is a, just an example of i have brought that 90 this is just an uh, example in uh, last night uh, last 3 months 90 patients turned up came to aims emergency uh, miss like not in covid area before covid this uh, is uh, maybe last month in 3 months figure i have brought that 90 patients we have seen in emergency and their palliative prognostication score was like this more than 6 56 more than 4 26 and score less than 4 was 8 and you know uh, all these patients for malignancy patient they were having some kind of a malignancy and based on the palliative prognostication score when we explained about them 57 patients preferred home as place of end of life care they said that please relieve my suffering i want to go home 26 preferred hospital 
or in icu they said that we want to go in icu and uh, we want to take care of <coughs> i don't want to take my patient home and i want to stay at in the hospital and seven patient preferred hospice care which we uh, we send our patient to shanti vedna so out of 90 patients see majority of the patient when we explain them beforehand they want or they prefer home care they want to go home with relieved depression relieved uh, relieved suffering so this is just an example that if we will integrate properly your anesthesiologist will be able to train themselves that when patient should go home and when patient should be shifted in icu so how you will do this how you will integrate how you will practice it so <coughs> we have to realize that ultimately patient who is going to patient is suffering with chronic debilitating condition and end is near dying is inevitable we cannot conquer death by using technologically whatever you want to use you use but we cannot conquer death if patient is going to die he is going to die so because of the disease so what you have to do first step is honest accurate and early disclosure of prognosis to the family recognizing dying as a process you have to recognize you have to take all the stakeholders in the on the same page all the professionals those who are taking care of the patient including nurses they should be on the same page that patient is going to die and patient is have limited hours or limited days then you have to explain to this to the relatives you have to communicate to the uh, relatives all the physicians those who are on board and the family members they all should be on the same page when the consensus will come consensus amongst all the caregivers will be there that yes we have understood the prognosis we just want that symptoms should be relieved i don't want unnecessary extraordinary care for extraordinary icu care for my patient when these consensus will come you have to document everything on page that i have spoken to the relatives or to the wife or to the son or the daughter whosoever is there means it will come through the family meeting then you have to document everything and you have to create some kind of a protocol when where you are going to take care you are not going to desert this patient you are going to take care of this patient with and you have you are going to relieve intractable symptoms but you will do something which is the palliative foremost principle of palliative medicine that we are not going to hasten death by giving some kind of a uh, some kind of a drug because palliative medicine is not pro euthanasia we are not going to hasten death by giving some kind of a drug propofol or something and we are not going to postpone death by putting unnecessary patient in icu on ventilator on vasopressor so this is what the palliative care foremost principle is that we are going to consider death as a normal process and if patient is dying we are going to allow patient to go dignified death and we will do something we will control his symptoms so well so that he will not have a he will have a good death and he will unnecessary we will not prolong his suffering by putting him on unnecessary advanced technological advancement this is also very important for the uh, corporate hospital this slide that it is not that palliative care integration will be difficult in corporate hospital many of my residents they are going in corporate hospital and they are doing fantastic palliative care and they corporate hospital have started palliative care wings in delhi many of the corporate hospitals you have to just tell them that integration of palliative care is going to be beneficial not only for the patients and the family members but this will be beneficial for staff it will be beneficial for organization as well how it will be beneficial for staff if a patient we put on ventilator for months together in icu we also get demoralized we know that this patient is unnecessary paying money this patient is not going to come out we get demoralized we are guilty so if we will integrate proper integration of palliative care will be there staff will be satisfied with their professional profession and this will also create help in organization by vacating bed beds for the patient those who can be cured last two three slides there only so this we need to understand this is the philosophy of palliative care this dr raj gopal has said in the beginning that we cannot cure the patient we can care the patient if disease is becoming violent we can help patient by controlling symptoms and by but 
we I have 100% sure that we are not going to cure the underlying disease, but we can care the patient. And this is the foremost principle or philosophy of palliative care. Most of the time, palliative care, we consider it is end of life care. This is a big myth. It should be a principle should be that it should start from the beginning and it should remain till the end patient is patient death and it should also it should be continued after death to the caregivers i will not go into the detail of this diagram but i can tell you that if a patient is suffering with carcinoma breast and straight away she is going to surgical oncologist surgical oncologist is advising him her uh that we are going to remove your breast and then we will send you to medical oncologist that time patient is having lots and lots of problems and if a surgical oncologist and if oncologist will not have a basic knowledge of palliative medicine they will not be able to treat patient this lady as a whole the lady also wants to know that what is going to happen to my hair what is going to happen to my beauty what will take how whether if I will going to I'm going to die because of the disease because cancer is that is synonymous so all these things the practice if an oncologist will have a palliative care practice they will be able to handle this patient very well then patient should have then as the curative treatment will go on patient will uh, as the disease will progress palliative care physician should be involved from the beginning when the for example if a patient is better has become metastatic palliative care physician should be there and as the disease will progress patient will be able the palliative care physician will take the lead and the but the primary physician will always but if a patient is dying and you will send to palliative care the patient will get badly demoralized they will think that because i am dying they have sent to the me to the palliative care so please please make sure that wherever you are working there should be a practice that the palliative care should be integrated in the continuum of care and this will continue when patient is dying and finally when patient is after death if there is any 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 grievance in amongst the relatives or any guilt amongst the relatives they, we will be we should be able to solve so this will come only by giving realistic hope and throughout the journey patient should be getting realistic hope from you and this is this will come only by integration of concept of health this is again a big myth that palliative care is required only by by the cancer patient and i consider that cancer patients are very lucky they get at least palliative care in almost everywhere at least they have heard about the palliative care but all these patients also need palliative care a patient with chronic congestive heart failure a patient with uh, a chronic renal failure having dialysis thrice in a week still patient is breathless patient unable to go to the toilet patient is having alzheimer's patient with advanced hiv aids patient all these patients need palliative care so concept should be there in all ultimately we need this concept in our continuum of medical care uh, so these are the areas we have to work wherever we need to integrate that we have to create a team we have to under, impart this knowledge and i'm very happy dr jeshree and dr bimla thank you very much at least whosoever is listening they will and they will realize that at least we need to have a palliative care in integration we have to integrate palliative care and we will need a team so we they have to start working they have to start working with the available infrastructure which cannot ask for extra infrastructure whatever is the patient is there you are there we need just patient and you we don't need extraordinary infrastructure we will create infrastructure as we will go keep on improving and start making visible changes once the palliative care physician will be there in the team we will be able to say see that patient is pain relief patients are going happy they are satisfied unnecessary patients are not dying in icu so you will start making visible changes automatically administration will get attracted administration will listen to you whenever you need you will talk to the administration they will listen to you and this happens when i was asking one bed for palliative care i was i got one bed of palliative care in 7 days but once we got the six beds and we have we have made we have made the visible changes on six beds in Na national cancer institute we got 50 beds so automatically administration will listen to you and they will give you whatever you want for patient care you have to take your colleagues you alone cannot do most of the time we get get learn we get the training and we start we want to try that i will start palliative care in the hospital this will never happen you have to create a team 
you have to take your colleagues in the, your mission and you have to take care of yourself. So anesthesiologists, dear friends, they are multitasking always. They know anesthesia, we know. They do critical care. They do good pain management. But this is missing in your multitasking effort. Please integrate palliative care in continuum of care in wherever you are and wherever you are practicing. It should be your fifth pillar. We have made our four pillars, perioperative care, acute pain management, chronic pain management, critical care. This we are getting a lot of knowledge about it and we are we are training, uh, we are getting trained on all these four aspects. But this should be your fifth pillar. Palliative medicine should be your fifth pillar. And if you will not make this practice, you will not be getting what you want because we all, if we want to know that how where I want to die. I want to die in my at home. My residents, my hospital people, my colleagues, they know that if I'm suffering with chronic debilitating condition, if I'm not going to be, uh, I will not be able to make it. I will not survive. They will not put me in ICU. They will send me home by relieving me my symptoms. If you will not create this kind of a system, you will, everybody, uh, this is true that everyone in the world, even in the in India, the highest professors, head of the department, MPs, MLA, they all die in ICU with all sorts of tube and ventilators. So this is right time that we have to create a system we want where we want to die. If we will not integrate palliative care in continuum of care, if you not integrate palliative care practice in your hospital, Everybody, because this is what we have learned that if we are dying, if you are breathless, we have to you have we have to put a patient in ICU and on ventilator. So we have to create a system where we want to die. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Sushma. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. That was great, Dr. Stanley. Uh, I believe Dr. Rajgopal has already introduced Dr. Cynthia, but I, I, I missed that because my connectivity was lost. But I would just like to say that Dr. Cynthia is the chair of the Asia Pacific Hospice Network and also the co-chair of the World Palliative Care Alliance. More than all this, she's a dear friend of the Indian Association of Palliative Care, and she has contributed a lot to us through her personal interest and her various contributions. So we are indeed very happy to have her with us and she's going to uh, talk on the importance of assessment, proper assessment, as incomplete assessment leads to incomplete management. Welcome Dr. Cynthia. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Stanley Macadam. How nice to see you today. Uh, I'm going to try and share my screen um, and uh, I hope that the, the, the thing works because um, uh, let's see how that this works. Share. Um, can you see my screen now? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Yes, we can. You can go to the slides, slideshow. So uh, is that okay? Yeah, yeah. fine. Um, I've, I've been asked to talk about assessment and I, I think this is something which is very uh, it was just common across uh, the whole of medicine. But why is assessment important, particularly in, in palliative care? I think you can't do medicine um, if, you, if you can't assess properly. You can't treat a patient. You don't know how to manage a patient. Um, but how is palliative care assessment different from any other medical or nursing assessment? We know that palliative care tries to treat the whole person. We talk about it as whole person care. So we can't just stay in the physical domain. We have to assess the emotional coping. We have to assess the family, how they're, they're managing. We have to assess the social circumstances. Finances are very, very important nowadays in any kind of medical care. And of course, we also have to uh, look at the sp patient's spirituality. Physical assessment, uh, this is quite straightforward. This is what we learn in medical school. Uh, but we need to look at the symptoms properly, decide which one needs to be managed. Um, palliative care needs to be done by a, an interdisciplinary team because a lot of the uh, assessment and needs are nursing needs. How is the patient going to go home? Who is going to 
look after them? What are the caregivers going to do? So the nursing, uh, our nursing team members have a very um, strong um, input. And also we have to assess the patient's function. Then emotionally, we have to look at how the patient is adjusting to loss and uh, is there anxiety or depression? How, are, how is the family and the patient coping with the changes that need to be made uh, when a life-threatening illness is diagnosed? Um, patient may be thinking about losing loved ones. They're also losing all sorts of other things in their lives, their job, their lifestyle, uh, their personal independence. Then looking at the family, we see the change in roles, um, the family facing impending loss of loved ones. There are caregiving challenges. Who has to give up a job to look after the patient? If the patient was the caregiver. Who was going to look after the people that the patient is looking after? What is going to happen to the future of the family if the patient should die? And what are the regrets of unfulfilled duties? Socially, there is very often a change in social circumstances, a change in the role in society. We worry about the children. Can they still go to school? Can they afford to go to school? Um, what about social activities that the patient used to do, which she can't do now? And of course, we also have to face stigma of disease. And many of our diseases, including cancer, still carries a lot of stigma. Um, as I mentioned, the financial aspects of care is very, very significant now in medicine when everything is very, very expensive. Uh, the patient may have lost a job, um, may have changed his role from caregiver, from or breadwinner to someone who's requiring care and maybe may uh, consider themselves a burden to the family. We have to worry about the cost of treatment. Where are we going to find the money? The financial stress of the, on the family if we're going into debt and worry about future finances. How is the family going to manage um, with all, all the medical debt and losing the patient? Um, we also have to assess the spiritual aspects of our patient's coping. Pa patients, when they have a, a life-threatening illness, they may fear the unknown, they may fear retribution. Um, uh, they may wonder, I have been a good person all my life, why am I suffering? Um, their religion may dictate that they have to be very stoic, and yet they are in terrible emotional turmoil. And they think I've they feel guilty that I should, I should feel peaceful, I should accept my fate, but I don't. I don't want to die. Um, and how do we help the patient find hope in what is sometimes called a hopeless situation? So we start by taking a history. We always start by taking a history. But taking a history is not just getting the facts. It's about establishing a relationship. And in palliative care, taking a history means getting to know who this person is. Yes, we have to take the history of the present condition. What are the present symptoms? How did your illness start? When did it start? If it is a cancer, how was the cancer diagnosed? What treatment have you had so far? And are the ongoing treatment plans, are they appropriate? How much understanding does, does the patient and the family have of what is happening? And how realistic is their hope? What is their hope? That's all part of taking a history. I'd like to uh, give an example of, you know, Dr. Shushma, Dr. Naveen and I, we. Uh, run these trainings in cancer treatment centers in, in India. And twice a week, we have case-based discussions. And I'm just taking um, a case that we discussed last night in our case discussion. Madam Lalita, this is not her real name, uh, was a, a woman from Dehradun, 65-year-old woman. She presented with a left, with a lump in her left breast. Um, and um, in 2017, she had a modified radical left mastectomy. It was a large tumor, but um, it was early stage um, and not, not metastatic. And it was a good prognosis breast tumor, ERPR positive, HER2 negative. And yet she just faulted follow up. So this already we begin to um, think about alarm bells. Why would a woman like this with um, curable disease or some, something with long-term survival, why did she default? Because three years later, she presented to the emergency department giving a history. The family said she was disorientated for five days. She just had a seizure. And during the seizure, they witnessed generalized abnormal movements of both upper and lower limbs. 
So taking a history means talking about what is happening now? Um, what else is happening? Um, what sort of situation precipitated this seizure? What other symptoms are there? Is there any pain? And where, where is the pain? And for any pain, we have to take a detailed pain history. And remember, this disease, there's not usually only one pain. Probably 80% of the time, um, there would be two or more pains. And many of our palliative care patients have five or six or seven pains. So after taking a pain history of one pain, we have to say, is there pain anywhere else? And take another pain history. What about other symptoms? We do a systems review. Are there breathing difficulties, cough, sputum? How are you eating? What do you actually eat? What can you actually um, tolerate? Are there problems in swallowing? Are the bowels working? Any problems passing urine? Are you able to sleep? So a general systems review. And then family issues, because we have to think ahead. Um, who is going to look after the patient? Are they capable of going, um, being taught to look after the patient? Um, what does the patient understand about her condition? Are there other information needs? Um, what does the family know about the uh, condition? How do they think that it is treatable? And what sort of treatment do they understand? After the history taking, of course, um, a thorough physical examination. And to me, it is the physical examination that seals the relationship. While the history introduces you to who this patient is as a person, um, the physical examination actually um, builds on the trust. Um, of course, a thorough physical examination defines the causes of the symptoms. We have to exclude common conditions in, in this population of patients, oral thrush, constipation, do a rectal examination when necessary, pick up comorbid con con conditions apart from what, what is presenting. Um, at every um, encounter, whether it is the, uh, the first examination or follow-up, we routinely do the vital signs, examine the mouth, listen to the chest, examine the abdomen, look at the stoma or fistula or, or wounds, do a rectal examination if necessary, um, examine pressure areas such as broken skin, um, depending on how, how mobile the patient is. But the physical examination also communicates a lot to the patient about our respect for the person. My doctor and nurse is really careful not to miss anything. My doctor and nurse really cares about me and respects my modesty and respects my comfort when she, he or she touches me. So Madam Lalitha, going back, we do relevant investigations. So um, blood investigations were more or less normal. Uh, this was COVID time, so she had COVID screening according to admission protocol. She was admitted after her seizure. She uh, went on to have an MRI of her, her brain, which showed multiple brain metastases with midline shift. Uh, a CT chest and abdomen was normal, and she went on later on to have a bone scan, which found multiple bone metastases, particularly in the spine, um, in both the dorsal spine and the lumbar spine. Very often our patients present with many problems, and when we are faced with many issues, um, we have to prioritize. And how do we pri prioritize? Our priorities is really the patient's priorities. Um, early on in my career in palliative medicine, I used to think I will treat the things that I can treat and leave the things that I can't treat. I think that doesn't work because you see a patient in, in quite significant pain and you say, I can treat the pain. And yet if you ask the patient, what is it that troubles you most? The patient says, I'm worried whether my children can go to school or not. So treating the pain is not good enough. We have to take the patient's priorities as well. What troubles you most? What would you like me to help you with first? Is it getting you mobile again, getting home, getting the financial issues sorted out, caregiving um, issues sorted out? So ask. So when we say palliative care is whole person care, at the end of the assessment, we need to understand not just the history and the symptoms, not just the extent of the disease and prognosis, its effect on the family and caregiving issues, the financial implications of the disease. But the, at the end of the assessment, we need to be able to answer this question, who is this person and what is important to him or to her? 
I usually ask my residents to try to summarize in not more than two sentences who this patient is. For example, um, they might say, Mr. Seaver is a 62 year old former construction worker with advanced squamous cell carcinoma with a hypopharynx diagnosed in 2014 and treated with radiotherapy. The disease has recurred and current issues are severe neuropathic pain in the head and neck area and difficulties with eating, drinking and secretions. That's two sentences that crystallizes what is happening in this patient who may have very complex and other issues as well. So going back to Madam Lalitha, we may summarize her, her condition as saying, this is um, a 65 year old widow with two adult mar married children who, who was diagnosed with carcinoma, early di um, carcinoma of the breast in April, 2017. She defaulted treatment and currently presented with mental obtundation and seizure found to be due to brain metastases and bone metastases were also found. So summarize. Moving on, um, when we talk about palliative care being treating the whole person, it's important for us to see the patient as a whole person. We may see the person in front of us in the hospital bed, possibly in hospital pajamas, possibly in his own clothes. But what we don't see is who this person is. And I think it's very, very important to know what is the context um, that this person is a father, is a husband, is a grandfather, is a father-in-law, um, has a job, is an important person in the job. So all of these things we need to understand. And the unit of care is the patient and the family. So making a patient a family child is very much part of palliative care assessment. And I think many of you know how to draw, but just in case uh, for those who are not familiar with um, the uh, uh, how to draw a family chart. So squares means male, circle means female, um, um, a cross means deceased and a double line means this is the patient. So for example, uh, this is a female patient and this is her relationship. The first line um, is the, uh, sorry. Uh, the first one is a married lady um, with two lines, a, a divorced lady, a single line, separated and a dotted line, maybe living together, maybe engaged, um, uh, and maybe just a close relationship. And if there's more than one marriage, you can um, depict it like this. So if the patient is the husband, first wife was divorced, three children by the first wife, including a son and twin son and daughter. Then um, second wife, he's separated from his second wife. He has a daughter by his second wife. And then now he's living with another lady whom he introduces as his third wife, but actually they're not um, married to each other because he's still married to his second wife. And in this family chart, here is a, a, um, a patient who is married, um, whose parents, um, his, her mother is, has died, and she's got a father who's widowed. And this particular patient, also a lady, married with three children, two daughters and one son. And what about this? You can build a family child. You don't have to do it all in one sitting. Same lady um, who has um, a father, mother has died. She's married with two daughters and a son. And she has three siblings, an elder brother and an elder sister and eldest, eldest, a younger sister. And uh, you can see that the elder brother is married, um, has two children. The younger sister is divorced, has one child. Um, and you can say, who is living in the same household? So she lives with her widowed father, um, with her husband and children. Um, and you can add the ages of the children. Here you see a household um, of her divorced sis younger sister is living with her. Uh, there are four children under six. Um, and who is the caregiver? Actually, the patient is the caregiver. So if the patient can't look after the children, what's going to happen? Someone else has to look after the children. Um, so would it be the older sister? Uh, would it be the younger sister? You find out a little bit more. Can her father look after the children? No, he can't. So this 67 year old man, he's a diabetic amputee. He can't be running after four children under six. Um, uh, the patient's husband is a dispatch rider. He has to go to work. Um, so one of her sisters, probably the, um, the older sister, who's the child care helper, would have to give up work to look, help look after the patient and look after the young children. What about this family? Family structure exactly the same, 
but the children are of a different age. Um, these are, she has two adult daughters, age 22 and 20, um, and uh, they are also able to help look after her. So different kinds of family with different resources with very different issues. So going back to Madame Lalita, she, um, her father had died, her mother, uh, she, she, sorry, her husband has died. She's a widow living with her married son who has um, three children who are fairly young. And her daughter is also married, but she's living far away from the, from the family. And then there are different kinds of family. Here is a family with eight children. So you have to ask yourself, if the patient is the mother, who is, the care, uh, who is going to be the caregiver? And who makes the, the decisions this is in this family? Is it going to be the husband? Is it going to be the eldest son? Is it going to be the daughter who earns the most and who lives in America? Um, who in this family has the most say over treatment? And who has the most say over care? So recognizing family structure and knowing who they are is very, very important. Here is another family. Um, so the patient is the second wife um, of uh, um, her husband. The first wife had died um, and there are five children from the first marriage and she has three children of her own. Do these two families get together, uh, get on well together? Is, uh, are the children of the first wife, are they enemies of this woman whom they think has broken up the children, the, the family, or are they or is she the stepmother to all the children and they all love her and they all support her? So understanding the family structure, how the patient makes the decision, um, who is, um, has the most say over treatment and who is able to become caregiver is very, very important. Then documentation. As usual, we have to document in palliative care, we document the source of referral, who are the other clinicians who are involved, we document next of kin and how to contact them. The usual things, allergies, medications, histories, comorbidities, the oncological history, the physical complaints, all that of course has to be documented. But also we have to document the social history, family chart has to be drawn and religion, is this patient religious? It, um, or is, does religion play a relatively um, minor part in her life? Um, then the information needs, does the patient know her diagnosis and know her prognosis? Does the family know the diagnosis and prognosis? How are they coping with this information? And is there something that they need to know more? Then the other thing we need to document at the end of a palliative care assessment is, what are the goals of care? What does the, fam what does the patient expect? What does the family expect um, from, from the care that they're getting? Um, are they thinking that the treatment is going to cure them of their disease and that everything is going to go back to normal? Or if at least cure is not possible to extend survival for as long as possible, is this what the patient wants? Um, what about pain and symptom management? How important is that? Um, and what about minimizing financial burden? Is finance a problem at all? It may not be for some families, but it may be a huge problem for many families. Um, for many patients, optimizing function, they want to be as independent as possible. That's very important. Um, and for many pa patients, they want to optimize comfort. They want the least amount of suffering. Even if I have to be sick and I have to die, I don't want to die in pain. Uh, and then the goals of care may or may not be the same for the patient and the family. So you have to document that and understand that. And maybe you have to negotiate that. So we do a problem list. Um, and in our training, we usually um, ask our trainees to, to separate the problem into medical issues, nursing issues, function, psychological, social, financial issues, and spiritual issues, and then a, a management plan. So going back to Mother, Madame Lalita, here is a 65 year old um, widowed lady who had seizures, medical um, problems include her seizures, which need to be controlled, headache from raised intracranial pressure. She had some pain from bone metastases in her spine. Um, she was not mobile, um, uh, pressure area needed care. Uh, she could not um, eat properly because she was disorientated. She was mentally attended. Uh, she was not aware of her prognosis, even though she knew that she had breast cancer. What about caregiving issues? Who is able to give, uh, take care of her? 
um, is her son prepared to stop work to look after? Obviously not, he is the sole, sole breadwinner. Um, uh, what about the daughter-in-law? Can she look after three children and the mother-in-law? Our financial concerns, there were major, major financial concerns in this family. And are there spiritual concerns? So then after the assessment, we have a management plan. So we start a uh, levitacetum for control of seizures, dexamethasone for raised intracranial pressure. Uh, she was given morphine for pain from the headache and the bone metastases. Um, she was planned for whole brain radiation, which she received um, uh, 20 gray in five fractions. Uh, they also treated her bone metastases, eight grays, single fraction each to four sites. Uh, she was given um, follow-up with the oncologist for carcinoma of the breast. Um, caregiver training was given by, by the nursing staff. Uh, her, the finances of this family was very bad and treatment costs were waived by the, um, by the hospital through um, some of the schemes um, from the state. Um, NGOs were brought in to help support the, the family financially. Um, the family were given information about treatment, that there is still treatment for this patient because she has hormone positive disease um, and hormonal treatment may well be um, suitable for her. And the prognosis was also discussed. Um, spiritual concerns were looked at and the patient says she hopes to be cured, but even if she can't be cured, she wants to be pain free. So goals of care were being established. So we need comprehensive assessment to provide patient-centered care. If, if palliative care is about um, management and treatment of the whole person, then person-centered care is what we're looking at. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Cynthia. Thank you, Dr. Bishop. It was an excellent talk, and we'll take the questions at the end of the next lecture. Dr. Dr. Dam, would you like to introduce Dr. Navi? Yeah. Uh well, uh, I've known Dr. Naveen. The first time I met him was at uh, Australia, I think, way back in 2009. Uh, uh, since then, I've seen him grow by leaps and bounds. And uh, the next time I met him was at uh, Tata Memorial Hospital at Mumbai. And uh, now he's currently based at Manipal and uh, heading the Department of Palliative Medicine out there. And he's doing an excellent job. And uh, uh, well, what I can describe him as a, what I feel that he's just a perfect gentleman, soft-spoken and uh, very knowledgeable. Well, uh, uh, without much ado, I would hand over the platform to uh, Dr. Navin. Thank you, Dr. Dam, uh, for your introduction. Uh, uh, I'll just start uh, uh, sharing my screen. And is my slides uh, visible? Yeah, it's visible. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, uh, the topic that was given to me was uh, recent advances in pain management. And probably uh, uh, it's a misleading title uh, to what I'm going to talk uh, from now on. Um, I felt that uh, this topic uh, would have been best delivered uh, by Dr. Raj Gopal uh, because uh, A, uh, he is going has a, a perfect knowledge about various nuances of pain uh, and various uh, domains and aspects and uh, modifiers and influences. Uh, and it would have been my pleasure to listen to him talking uh, on this topic. Uh, but uh, it's uh, on me to talk. So uh, I was just thinking uh, that what is that that is the most recent advances in pain management? Should I speak about the new drugs or new procedures? I should not be see, uh, speaking about a procedures because I'm not an anesthetist and neither I don't uh, do any of the procedures. And maybe uh, uh, it could, uh, could have been some drug uh, or uses of drug. 
but i chose to uh, uh, this topic uh, that was about the the new definition of pain and why it is important uh, for us as both palliative care physicians or pain physicians or anesthetists uh, to know about uh, this topic and uh, this new definition of pain uh, came out in july 16th of 2020 that's uh, almost uh, a month and a half ago and i felt that this is something that we should talk about and if you look at uh, the iasp that is the international association for study of pain the original definition of pain uh, came in 1979 and uh, after a few decades later the the new definition of pain so i was 2 years old when the first definition of pain came and to see uh, after a, such a long time uh, a new def almost uh, uh, 40 uh, years that's the new definition that is coming so uh, i did a, a small uh, exercise uh, i put uh, the the old definition uh, and the new definition in uh, a software called as an nvo and nvo software creates what is called as a word cloud and word cloud is to look at uh like uh, an overview of what the words are talking about uh, a definition versus what the words are being represented in the new definition if you see the 1979 definition what stands out is damage it's all about damage to uh, uh, to the tissues or damage to the nerves or talking more in terms of what is called as nociception but if you look at the word cloud of 2020 uh, it looks more beyond the damage if you look at that it looks at the experience or experiences it looks at the social aspects it looks at the sensory aspect it looks at the psychological aspect it looks at various different domains so there has been uh, a paradigm shift in what pain was uh, uh, thought Uh, of in 1979 to what uh, is the pain that is being uh, imagined uh, or uh, being described in 2020 so let's look at what is this paradigm shift what is this new or advancement in the definition which makes us think differently about pain and differently about pain management so if you look at this old definition uh, it talked about an unpleasant sensed and emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage but the new definition ha- added one extra term called as or resembling that so it's an unpleasant sensed and emotional experience associated with or resembling that i won't tell what is this or resembling that now i will tell this at the end of the my talk so that once we go through this the entire talk we know why they have included this new word called as or resembling that so let's uh, uh, go into uh, the the new definition and the new definitions when they came out had what was called as a six keynotes so they had definition and it had six keynotes uh, which became part of the 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 pain definition so uh, i will go uh, through each of the keynote and let's discuss briefly about each of these keynotes and then uh, let's go to the question and answer session that comes after this session so the first keynote uh, that described was described was pain is always a personal experience that is influenced to varying degrees by biological psychological and social factors so pain is always a personal experience which is influenced by varying degrees by biological psychological and social factors so what does this keynote one means so let's uh, take an example now ramesh is a 34 year old uh, man he is a father of two young daughters he has a squamous cell carcinoma of the right buccal mucosa 
he has a deep seated pain over the right side of the face he is irritable sad he is anxious and is unable to sleep he is worried about his two uh, school going children he is a uh, actually a daily wage worker and he is the breadwinner of the family and he has this constant thought that the god is punishing him so if we look at keynote 1 what did the keynote 1 say pain is always a personal experience which is influenced to a varying degrees by biological psychological and social factors if you take uh, about ramesh he is a young man father of two uh, young daughters so being young uh, diagnosed uh, with a terrible illness he is very emotional about it and he is the breadwinner he is the daily wage worker so this not just the physical pain he is experiencing the emotional or the psychological pain and the social pain the diagnosis of cancer is distressing the pain is the biology of the cancer or the the physical component of the pain he is irritable and anxious which is the emotional component he is worried about the future of his daughter that's the this is a huge social component and he probably has uh there is an interruption in the relationship with the god and he is thinking that the god is punishing him so if you look at this patient is not just that the physical pain this person is experiencing it is he is experiencing the host of things so there are so many things that modifies the pain we always understand pain as a physical sensation but it's not just the physical sensation it is the emotional experience and along the pain pathway there are things that are modifying the pain so there are aspects that lower the pain threshold or there are aspects that increases the pain threshold now suppose if the person is not sleeping well if the person is very tired person does not know what's happening he is very bored he does not have enough family support he is socially isolated he is bound to feel the pain much more than a person who has other symptoms control who is fully aware of his illness he has got a very really, uh, caring and supporting family he understands about his illness he is able to express his uh, concerns and emotion so imagine it's not just the physical sensation here it is the host of the things that are modifying the thing and what are these that are modifying the thing are the biological the psychological and the social factor so that is the keynote one that is the the biological psychological and social factor impact the personal experience of the pain if you look at the keynote two pain and nociception are two different phenomena pain cannot be inferred solely from activity in sensory neurons so to describe the keynote two i would like you to go into the pain pathway so pain pathway has four steps there is transduction transmission modulation and perception so you have nociceptors in the skin and also on the the free nerve endings so here the mechanical stimulus gets converted to an electrical stimulus that is transduction which gets transferred along the nerves goes up to the spinal cord ascending tracts and to the various parts of the brain this is nociception the process of transduction and transmission most of our understanding is reduced to nociception that's why we believe very strongly in pharmacological management or doing neurolytic procedures or nerve blocks and thing what does these things do the pharmacological thing and the the, the procedures that we do has an impact on nociception that is the transduction and transmission but there is a very important component called as a modulation where the pain becomes enhanced or inhibited so we cannot reduce the pain to only nociception that's why we call it as a total pain management where we not just manage the physical aspect of the pain but also look at the other dimensions of the pain which is impacting the pain so that's a very important key note that we should remember so if you look at this diagram here so we have the noxious stimuli physiological transmission of pain and sensory perception of pain 
the first two things the noxious stimuli and the physiological transmission of pain is the nociception part but how does it get modulated it is the cognitive aspect that is our past experience of the pain the the belief our beliefs about pain our attitudes to the pain our emotions associated with the pain and our behavioral response to the pain everything modulates the pain which is finally perceived so that's why we cannot reduce the pain into just into nociception so if the keynote 2 says that pain and nociception are two different phenomena reducing pain to nociception is a major pitfall in pain management that is thinking that only drugs will work only procedure will work is reducing pain to nociception so we need to go much holistically the third keynote in uh, understanding pain is through their life experiences individual learn the concept of pain so what do we understand by this concept so if you look at the neuro matrix of pain so there is what is called as an input to the neuro matrix and output to the neuro matrix so what are the inputs to the neuro matrix our past memories of pain as a huge impact on our present experiences so suppose uh, we talk about a lot of in chemotherapy uh, associated induced nausea and vomiting there is a term that what we use called as an anticipatory nausea and vomiting that means a person who has taken chemotherapy in the past when they come to the day care and when the nurse is preparing the chemotherapy before the chemotherapy is administered the person will start vomiting in anticipation why because the past experience of taking chemotherapy led to vomiting and they think that this present experience also will lead to that here when we talk about the neuro matrix of pain the past experience of pain it could be related to a procedure or it could be related to an intervention and the the meaning associated with the pain how comfortable the person felt or how distressing the person felt has a huge impact on what the person is going to experience now so when we are doing the pain management one of the important aspect is to explore the past experiences of the pain because it's going to impact the the present experience so that's another keynote that what we need to take into account the fourth keynote that what we say is, is a person's report of an experience as pain should be respected uh, as doctors or as physicians our medical training is completely geared towards being objective in our measurement so we measure pulse rate in a number the blood pressure is a value uh, your temperature your oxygen saturation or your blood chemistry they are all very objective measurements and there are objective there are ways to measure pain also there are certain skills but it is not an objective thing it is more of a a subjective uh, phenomenon so this is a picture from one of the patients that i have taken who had come to the ward and the the picture speaks for itself she is almost in the fetal position so remember i talked about the the definition what was called as resembling that so when we talk about resembling that that means that verbally is not only the way to express pain we need to uh, respect various forms of pain expression and various individuals will express pain in different ways so that if they are not able to verbalize and tell the pain that does not mean that the pain is not present and second thing is uh, we need to focus more on the rich descriptive story the patient comes with rather than the the, the pain score numerical rating score score or certain other pain scale so this is a very important aspect of pain assessment this is a just brought the scale just to tell that how insufficient sometimes the scales could be this is what we call this an edmonton classification system of pain and if you look at this there is no role for an individual uh, expression of pain or a the rich description of the personal experience of the pain 
so sometimes skills per se or we like skills we like tools we like staging everything but for pain i don't know how appropriate it is now if we go to the keynote file pain usually serves as an adaptive role however it may have adverse effects on function social and psychological well being so when we talk about pain pain is a protective reflex isn't it if we do not have pain it can cause more damage when you're cooking in the kitchen you touch a hot utensil you immediately withdraw your hand it has an adaptive role because it's protecting you uh, you develop a severe pain abdomen that makes you goes to the doctor and doctor diagnoses you to have an acute appendicitis pain helped you to diagnose this an acute appendicitis which otherwise would have caused a complication and a burst appendix and things like that but in certain condition it loses its adaptive role and then it becomes what is called as a mal adaptive pain so acute pains are very adaptive pains they are protective they are necessary and they are short lasting but when we talk about managing pain we are talking about mal adaptive pain they are the chronic and the cancer pain where the the presence of pain has lost its purpose pain has a purpose what is the purpose of the pain is to tell that you are in a danger you need help or you need some medical attention but you have already an osteoarthritis the doctors have established osteoarthritis and the pain is persisting it has lost its purpose it is no more purposeful so it has become a mal adaptive pain so most of the pain management with that we are talking about is a mal adaptive pain where it has lost its purpose and it could be a static pain in a a chronic pain setting or in a cancer pain it's very dynamic pain uh, because it changes with the disease uh, and uh, if the disease is getting better the pain may come down or the disease getting the pain may go up the other aspect of that is the impact of pain uh, so there is a saying that manage pain before pain manages you or the pain manages the person a person whose pain is unmanaged over a period of time undergoes deconditioning so what do you mean by deconditioning is they uh, start uh, their performance status become less and less they become curled up in a corner uh, their whole activities may come down to it can have a neuropsychiatric uh, uh, mechanism that is what we call the pain behavior they could become more angry they could become more irritable anxious depressed so it's huge host of neuropsychiatric neuroimmune it uh, changes the the interleukin levels the t cell functioning there are studies though that are emerging which says that uh, patients with cancer with well managed pain responds better to chemotherapy compared to a patient with poor, poorly managed and it has got a huge effect on the endocrine system it increases the cortisol levels uh, because of increase in the cortisol level it could suppress the immunity so it's in this in huge neuro hormonal and overall quality of life can become poor so basically when we talk about biopsychosocial factors uh, changes the perception of pain at the same time biopsychosocial factors impact the outcome of pain so uh, in many ways even the pain could lead to loss of finances loss of employment will to live and patients becoming isolated so there is what we call it as a pain disability index questionnaire where you not just looking at when you talk about assessment of pain one important aspect that we need to assess is what is the how is the pain impacting the person on the person's uh, day to day life in terms of his family responsibility recreation social activity occupation sexual behavior self care everything how it is impacting that's a very important thing to look for the last keynote is verbal description is one of the several behaviors to express pain inability to communicate does not negate the possibility that a human or a non human animal experiences pain most of the previous uh, iasp definition and the scales 
relied largely on verbal description of pain but verbal description the new isp definition says it's one, one of the descriptors or one of the behaviors to suggest that there is pain and lack of uh, or inability to communicate pain does not negate the possibility that a person is experiencing pain so there are what we call it as a non verbal descriptors of pain so when we say non verbal descriptors like noisy breathing patient could be having loud harsh breathing negative vocalization um moaning groaning grunting repetitive words uh, sad facial expression hurt look trouble distress crying tears coming down being looking apprehensive scared whole body become tensed and fidgety uh, okay and being restless aggressive all could be the non verbal descriptors and if you look in children uh, how what are the ages and how children will be able to describe pain and if you look at up to 4 uh, years um, the the verbal description is almost non existent 0 to 2 years is behavior 2 to 4 is some verbalization and only at some 5 years away they are able to ten, tell some pain intensity and at 6 years they are able to differentiate pain intensity and most of the numerical rating scales or the scales that we use are more than 7 years of age group only that you can use so non verbal pain description especially in a pediatric population becomes very very important and also if you look at uh, other uh, patients uh, like other scales there are so many uh, non verbal scales like for neonates or uh, two months to three years like black scale three to six years berry face scale so if you see like more than 7 years is when the nrs or the vas scale uh, comes into picture so uh, this is a very important uh, thing that we need to uh, look for so basically in my presentation i looked at the, the six keynotes uh, which the iasp came out in july 2020 and i felt that uh, more than a drug or speaking about a procedure understanding the newer understanding the concept of pain probably is relevant uh, for all the the practitioner i thank you very much for the time and opportunity provided to me thank you very much dr salins how well you explained the new nomenclature that has come recently we would have never been able to analyze it this way thank you so much thanks a lot and uh, now you, would we like dr stanley to kindly take over can somebody help with the questions yes sure they were the several first of all all the three lectures were so enlightening and so good and uh, the topics were so well selected and the speakers were so perfect that uh, in each lecture we got to learn so much so many new things which are unimaginable and uh, i can also say that our department started palliative care in our department uh, about a year and a half ago and uh, dr stanley was there to help us and so also sushma and our hospital the the hospital chairman was very uh, impressed by the palliative care that we are doing and now the palliative unit is in our department attached to our department so coming to the various questions that have been asked um somebody has asked this question of palliative chemotherapy does it pa palliative chemotherapy stops at which stage of the terminal cancer patients somebody like to answer this question so uh, i think this is the uh, this is a combined decision that uh, when should we stop palliative chemotherapy it is not always correct to say that palliative uh, chemotherapy is always bad it is not like this the so patient we have seen metastatic cancer patients those who have been given palliative chemotherapy they do well they survive 
for a good length of time and their quality of life is good but in case chemo in spite of giving chemotherapy patient is not improving and having intolerable side effects and the side effects are so much that quality of life is uh, getting disturbed but there is no at, not at all there is anything which is happening to the disease i think we should uh, oncologist and the uh, palliative care physician should start discussing that uh, whether we should continue and this discussion should happen only with patients and family member first because they were the they are the one those who should decide and we should empower them because if we will not explain them about the uh, about the pros and cons of any treatment they will say whatever doctors are whatever is all right please do it and if we will keep offering them they will keep on getting and they will keep on worse we will keep on worsening their quality of life so this is very important that we must discuss with the patients and the relative we should empower them with the decision making because many a times they will not be able to make decisions so there should be a honest information and giving realistic hope will govern that when should we stop chemotherapy May I add to that? Yes, please, Cynthia. Yes, please, Cynthia. Yes, please. There was a time. There was a time when um, people did not refer to palliative care while uh, patients were still having what is so-called active treatment, which is chemotherapy, radiotherapy, surgery, and so on. But now, most of the patients that I see with cancer continue to have anti-cancer treatment, very much. Uh, until towards the last, uh, the very last part of their, um, uh, the course of their illness. And uh, there was a time when we said chemotherapy, you know, uh, we only give it when um, you're trying to cure the disease or you're trying to prolong survival. But actually there is a, um, uh, a role for chemotherapy in certain diseases for symptoms. For example, in um, uh, sometimes in, in small cell lung cancer with um, SVC obstruction, in intestinal obstruction, in um, ovarian cancer and so on, these very chemosensitive tumors, um, you may wish to um, get uh, catch the window when, where uh, chemotherapy still has a benefit for symptom, symptom control. Uh, but I think what is important is that you should always weigh up the benefits against the uh, um, uh, the dangers of chemotherapy or of any therapy. Um, if the, if the therapy is there any benefit, will will the tumor respond? And if it will it respond in time? And how long is the response? And is it going to be a partial response or or um, uh, uh, temporary? Uh, the, very often with um, palliative chemotherapy, uh, the response rate is of the order of fifteen to thirty percent. Uh, the duration of response may be um, three to six weeks. So um, when we say we want to empower the patient and the family uh, to help make the decision of whether we should carry on chemotherapy, those are the facts that the families need to know, that this is not going to cure the disease. Um, there is a 30% chance or there is a 10% chance of um, a response to the treatment. Um, and that response is only going to last a few weeks. Do you still want that? Um, the patients will also want to know, and the family will want to know, is there a survival advantage um, in doing this? Very often in palliative chemotherapy, there isn't a survival um, benefit, even though there may be a tumor response. Um, so I think to enable um, the family and the patient to, to make the decision, we need to give these sorts of facts as far as we know them to them. Jaisha, you're muted. Sorry. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think both the answers have, have satisfied the person who asked the question. Thanks a lot. Uh, the next question was for Sushma, I think. Somebody wanted to know, Sushma, since you talked about the COVID patients, uh, are you treating, managing these patients in the COVID ward or in the COVID ICU? So there is a, a COVID area in Ames. So there are two separate dedicated area. One is Trauma Center and one is National Cancer Institute. We have created a COVID area. There, if mild to moderate, we, will, we manage in the ward. But if patient is sick in the ICU, many patients comes out. But if a patient is already having a background uh, 
background advanced disease we start explaining to the relatives and many relatives are opting not to go for aggressive therapy so we are managing in a dedicated uh, area we cannot manage in the hospital as such in the, there is a covid area is separately yeah. yes so if we need to go we need to go that's right uh, there was another question that was asked that if a patient uh, at a terminal stage uh, has a subacute intestinal obstruction and having miserable physical pain, what would be the best advice for pain management at home care? Um, would Dr. Naveen like to answer the question? So uh, uh, it's a bit challenging to manage uh, a subacute intestinal obstruction at home uh, uh, for the primary reason that uh, uh, the patient may not be take, able to take orally because the patient is vomiting, is constipated, has a distension of abdomen. That said, uh, sometimes we do manage these uh, patients at home and uh, we will probably have to put a subcutaneous line and give medication subcutaneously. Uh, there are, it's a, it's a, it's a complex uh, management uh, process, not just managing pain. You are also managing other symptoms associated pain. And also you are trying to see whether we can uh, de-obstruct uh, the mechanical obstruction that is there. So uh, ideal uh, would be uh, if you have an access to give uh, uh, for pain management, uh, smaller doses of uh, fentanyl subcutaneously or um, uh, 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 fentanyl as a patch because it is least uh, GI uh, side effects along with giving dexamethasone which is steroid to help both vomiting uh, uh, and if the vomiting is a predominant symptom sometimes we give also uh, uh, haloperidol uh, and uh, it depends whether it's a complete uh, or a partial obstruction if it's a partial obstruction then there is a role for giving metoclopramide also. So, uh, and if there is an associated colic, uh, which is there, then we may have to give hyoscine butyl bromide. So uh, I cannot answer this question in one drug or two drugs. There is a, a, a an approach uh, of managing this uh, symptom. Yeah. Right. Dr. Joshua, and, can uh, I just add to that? Yes, yes, um, of course. Uh, talking about integration, you know, uh, in, uh, in a home care situation like this, especially in the context of uh, subacute obstruction, intestinal obstruction, it would be very helpful if a surgical colleague could come with you just to see this patient and then he can get back to his work just to rule out whether there is any possibility of venting procedure, especially if it's a single obstruction. Uh, otherwise, then once you have ruled that out, then you can, you know, what Dr. Naveen was saying, just to go ahead. But you've given the benefit of that doubt to the person and the family also will appreciate that. And the surgeons are very much a part of the palliative care, several surgeons, yes. Um, thank you. Another question for you, Dr. Naveen is, how would you differentiate from malingering pain from real subjective pain? So, uh... In palliative care uh, setting, uh, in pain management, we seldom see uh, a malingering uh, patients. Huh? However, uh, in a chronic pain setting, uh, you may get uh, uh, patients who may be malingering. Uh, my first instinct is always trust the patient and trust that the patient is telling the, the right thing. However, uh, that said, uh, most important thing in malingering is there is a secondary gain. What is the patient has to gain from the pain? Okay, usually in malingering, there is always uh, a secondary gain uh, associated with it, which is not there in the other pain setting. And uh, we, um, it's not that I have, haven't seen, and for that, you need to spend a lot of time with the patient. You can't make this decision uh, uh, on uh, abruptly and say that this patient is malingering. A lot of time uh, we use a term called as a pseudo addiction. Uh, we have seen junior doctors often telling, oh, this patient is addicted to opioids. Actually, what is happening is that you are not provided an appropriate dose of opioids. 
and maybe you have provided half the dose or one third of the dose the person is needing and the person has some relief and is asking for more relief it is not actually a drug seeking behavior but actually a symptom relief seeking behavior which is often confused as a drug seeking behavior so uh, so i think most of the times uh, we, our most of the t- our patients are right especially in a palliative care setting however in a chronic pain setting always we have to explore the secondary gains of pain uh, and then that may be a uh, starting point to look at whether it's malingering or whether it's a real pain and also we need to not just consider malingering pain we also have to consider somatization disorder and what is called as a factitious pain disorder which has got more psychiatric component to that uh, so it's not just uh, a or b there are many other aspects that needs to be considered along with that that's right true uh, several questions ahead another one uh, that is asked is that in a small town where no palliative care is available how do you practice palliative care do you do it on video sessions with the palliative care physicians who are there in the in the cities what would be your answer maybe sushma or sankhya anyone i think in a small town i think that's what i told that we should have a practice we should have a we should train our doctors from their undergraduate and postgraduate training they should have a good knowledge of basics of palliative care so that they automatically but it is not there but uh, at least there should be a concept of palliative care should be taught to all the doctors but second thing if at all they have not been taught they should get trained themselves if they are not trained then a uh, definitely telemedicine can help and they can get connected with the wherever the palliative care is getting practiced but ha- i i believe that uh, n- now it's a high time that all the doctors and the nurses they should have a basic knowledge of palliative care to the so that they can give a to, so they can provide total care to the patient yeah so it will be you know take a few years for that but that would be the answer ultimately right i'd like to give uh, um, i'd like yes, to please. yes please yes and here an example in eastern thailand uh, yeah. where dr srivya in konkan university has run courses for senior district nurses so in all the all the districts in her very large um, uh, province that she works in she has a nurse in each, each district who is palliative care trained not you know uh, not strongly palliative care but they've done a course in her university um, and when they identify a problem they will call the unit uh, where she works and they will support this nurse to provide palliative care to that district whether the patient needs to travel up or whether what what the nurse can do on her own So this is one health system um, thing that we could be thinking about. Very true. I think with Dr. Sushma in the lead, she's doing, uh, trying a lot for the country, uh, and I'm sure she'll really manage to educate our nurses as well. Uh, one very interesting question that someone has asked is, uh, how does um, palliative care differ from hospice care? Dr. Naveen, would you like to answer that? How does hospice care differ from palliative care? So, uh, you see, palliative care is in continuum, uh, and it starts from the the diagnosis uh, of uh, a critical slash terminal or a chronic illness, and goes along the journey of the patient until the patient's death and beyond to the family. Uh, Uh, into the bereavement phase but when we speak about hospice care it is one aspect of palliative care which uh, restricts itself uh, to the care of the dying or the last uh, weeks of life or last months of life uh, and the it's uh, more than the building it's an approach uh, where uh, when we talk about uh, uh, palliative care there are what i always use three circles two circles and one circle so when we talk about uh, uh, the palliative care where we do a symptom control uh, where we provide supportive care and also whatever the disease modifying treatment that is needed for example a metastatic breast cancer who has got a, a, a meds to the spine may require a palliative radiotherapy and still appropriate to receive 
palliative care and palliative infant treatment also but when we speak about hospice care the disease modifying aspect goes away it's predominantly focused more on symptom control and managing the symptom and providing some supportive care and if you go beyond that into end of life care is just symptom management where you don't you investigate anything or don't do anything just manage the symptom so we have to understand it as a continuum rather than uh, separate watershed uh, entities um perhaps i could give um a historical perspective to this to say that hospice care is really a a, a, a type of funding that happened in america uh, a long time ago i think it was 1987 um in in america if you go for hospice care you get free home care for 6 months but you must forego anti cancer treatment um and this was originally started to help um contain healthcare costs at the end of life um so hospice care um then became uh, got a bad name it never caught on americans don't want to go for hospice because they feel that you know i don't want to forego anti cancer treatment in order to have symptom control um so uh so what dr navin says is correct that palliative care um as we know it now starts at diagnosis and goes right to the end of life and beyond to bereavement but if you happen to be to live in america and get hospice care funding it's got a the medicare hospice benefit then um you get get free home care in the us for 6 months um and you but you cannot be having chemotherapy and radiotherapy at the same time so what people do nowadays is that people will go for hospice care uh when they don't need to have for example radiotherapy for the bone bone metastases then they will come out of hospice care in order to go in for their radi- radiation or their chemotherapy then they go back into hospice care and they count the um 180 days of um uh home care funding that they get so really is a very artificial um divide between hospice care and, and palliative care uh, thank you cynthia uh one of the last few questions um that may dr sushma i could just ask you one question uh what is the role of passive euthanasia in india um Uh, i think there is no uh, according to palliative care physicians there is no role of passive passive euthanasia uh, however uh, the the supreme court verdict uh, has given this word but i think this is a misnomer uh, they, we should not practice this there is nothing like we are going to give anything like passive euthanasia so i i i don't practice and uh, i think it's a totally a misnomer giving good palliative care to a patient is the right uh, uh, right uh, offer right thing which we should offer to the patient rather than uh, word uh, using word passive euthanasia uh, can i uh, just add one comment here is that uh, what yes. has happened is that um, it's basically a, a misunderstanding as madam has said it's a misnomer uh, Uh, uh technically euthanasia cannot be passive isn't it because euthanasia means you are it's an active act of doing something and usually uh, the for the process of withholding or uh withdrawing a life sustaining treatment in a patient uh, with a medically futile condition is been confused as passive euthanasia and that's why because of this confusion government says passive euthanasia is allowed so uh, 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 dr raj gopal was part of an icmr commission uh, uh, which came out with uh, a terminologies a new set of terminologies for end of life care and uh, with that uh, the if you that's a document that is downloadable from the icmr website and was also published as a paper which clearly stated that this is a misnomer term and should not be used and a clarification was provided in that document Pro- probably dr rajgopal sir can uh, add a couple of lines to this the sir was i think chairman. he had to leave because okay. he wasn't well okay. and uh, um okay. that completes most of the questions and i'd like dr vijit dam and dr stanley mm-hmm. to give some concluding remarks please abhijit you want to go ahead 
uh, yeah, 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 yeah. It was a wonderful session, and uh, especially uh, like to thank Dr. Cynthia uh, uh, for her excellent talk. Uh, was when she was describing uh, the whole spectrum of care, uh, especially the focus, uh, especially in uh, situations where I practice in resource poor. The very concept uh, is uh, the concept of home care becomes so important. So uh, unless you do a full assessment, and uh, as I believe that assessment begins at home of the patient, unless you know the patient as a whole, unless you show compassion, unless you put yourself in the shoes of the patient, you really can't do justice. So that is how the story did. Okay. So that is uh, something uh, which uh, actually struck me. Dr. Stanley. Um, I just want to, can, can you hear me? Yeah. I just yes. want to uh, say that uh, as anesthesiologists, I think it's very important, like what Dr. Sushma emphasized, that palliative care is integrated into ICU care. And the anesthesiologist to consider this as the fifth pillar that you so very well do otherwise. And so I'd like to just uh, thank everybody, the participants for uh, active participation and all the speakers and my co-moderators. Thank you, Dr. Jayashri and Dr. Sanish for all the uh, logistic arrangements. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Rajgopal, although he had to go, Dr. Stanley, Dr. Dam, and our eminent speakers, Dr. Sushma, Dr. Cynthia, and Dr. Naveen, for really our evening was so constructive and we are going home so enriched. And all those who do, did not have any knowledge about palliative, I'm sure they're now convinced that they should start participating in this. Thank you very much. Thank you.